here and watching a message from Redbud Baptist Church featuring Pastor Carlos Hinojos. Redbud is located at 801 Slide Road in Lubbock, Texas. Please join us for Sunday services at 1040 a.m. We're a going church, growing disciples. Enjoy the message. Is uh, Darkness is the place where there is the absence of light. Well, there is no light. There is darkness. As I thought about that statement, I thought about our country and where it is today. So I, I spent a lot of time looking back to um, 9-11. As you all know, we, we just spent a week discussing that and uh, posting pictures on social media and sharing statements and comments about um, 9-11 and what this nation went through during that time. And I thought <clears throat> if I go back and research and look at the time frame and discover where, where did we get from uh, the events of uh, right after 9-11 and, and where we are today, where we are right now, 2019, September of 2019. How did we, how, how, how long did all of that last? And I thought, well, <clears throat> you know, as good Americans as we are, I thought, well, you know, maybe that lasted up until about 2014, 12, somewhere around there. All of the excitement of uh, who we are as a nation, our flag, our, our pledges, our, our, our history, all of those things. I, I thought, well, you know, it, it, surely the momentum and in the enthusiasm lasted for quite a while. And so I, so I began to look for articles and statements and comments about, you know, our country, our flag, and all these things. And, uh, and, I, and I, I kept going, and I kept going. I got to 2014, I got to 2015, uh, uh, 12 and 10, and I kept going back and back and back. Do you realize that in a short, almost two years, all of the hoopla and the enthusiasm of, of us as a nation went out the window. By 2002, and almost 2003, the majority of Americans had forgotten about 9-11. That was a tragic event, to say the least. Do you remember, right after 9-11, shortly thereafter, we all went to church that next Sunday, and the churches were packed out. I don't know of a denomination that did not experience a surge in church attendance. Just about every place that calls itself a church, no matter what the denomination is, had thousands of people there. Most of them afraid of what was going to happen, uncertain of the future, worried about will we experience another attack, and on and on and on it went. And for about six months or so, maybe an entire year, a lot of churches experienced a full house. About a year later, churches went back to being half full, most of them empty. There probably have been more churches closed since 9-11 than there has ever been in quite a while. The leaders of the nation, the preachers of the nation, 
the people who were talking about the impact of this event said maybe this served as the wake up call to us as a nation. Maybe this is the one thing that finally got this nation's attention and to help it realize that while we may be the most powerful nation in the world, we certainly are by far the best nation morally and spiritually. In fact, I want to tell you, there are other nations in the world, not necessarily because of 9-11, but there are other nations of the world who have made more spiritual progress than our own nation. There are nations right now that are experiencing a, a, a boom of revival. People go into church, not because there's a 9-11, not because there's terrorists, not because of anything except that those nations said, if that can happen to that nation, what do you think can happen to ours? If they can sneak into that nation and fly four airplanes, two of them into two towers and another one into the Pentagon, the heart and soul of where we, our military derives from, the Pentagon of all places. And had it not been for a few brave men and women on one flight, chances are maybe even the White House would have been taken out. We in America need God. Amen. We need God. Today, this church, like thousands of other churches across the nation, are participating in, in what we call Back to Church Sunday. And the goal of Back to Church Sunday is to encourage church people to invite somebody to come to church with them on that Sunday, better yet, to bring them with you. I don't want a show of hands, but how many of us invited somebody this week? How many of us took the time to invite somebody to come to church. Listen folks, it's not what the world is doing out there. It's what we are doing in here. I wanna tell you that if it's dark in our nation, if it's violent in our nation, if it's troublesome in our nation, if you're worried about our nation, if you're concerned about our nation, it's not because of them. It's because of us. We are the light. They can't be light. They don't know the light. They don't understand what the light means. If you go out there and you tell the world the light, they have absolutely no idea what you're talking about unless you explain it to them. We are the light. And if there's any darkness, if there's any violence, if there's any trouble, you can blame the political parties if you want to, you can blame the politicians if you want to. You can blame your state houses or your national houses. Whatever you want to do, you can blame any of those people that you want. But I want to ask us a question this morning because this is Back to Church Sunday and we're about bringing people back to church. Where is the church? Where is the church? Where is the church? Where is the church in the conversation? Where is the church in the debate? Where is the church in the interaction and the discussion? Where is the church? Where are we? I'm glad that you're here. If you're a guest, I'm so glad that you're here. For a split second, we were a nation once again. The parts became one. Every group imaginable, no matter what 
denomination you were from, no matter what political party you affiliate with and support, no matter any of those things, we came for a short time and we were Americans. We were Americans. We were Americans. We celebrated. Do you remember July the 4th, right after 9-11? Do you remember that one? I saw more posts on social media this week. I, I tried to remain silent, but I saw more posts of, on social media about falling buildings and people flying out of buildings because they didn't want to burn in buildings and firefighters dying and MT people dying and so forth than I saw of the celebration that went on after 9-11. Go back and look. See if you saw any pictures of parades. See if you saw any pictures of, of people celebrating and saying, hey, no matter the struggle that we might be going through, no matter the, 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 the terribleness of 9-11, we came together as a nation. We became one. We became a people. We became a nation. And we loved one another and we cared about each other and we took care of each other and we didn't forget. I didn't see any of that posted on social media. I try to remember where I was and what I did. This is how busy we are. Sylvia and I said to each other, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, we need to put our flag out. I don't know if everybody else does that on the celebration or the remembrance of the memorial of 9-11, but we need to put our flag out. We need to put it out there and we need to say, you know what, this may be going on in our nation and this may be going on here and there, but we're still Americans and we're going to put our flag out as a, as, a, as a symbol of we are Americans. You know what? We forgot. We forgot. Because I'll tell you, it is easier, it is easier, it is easier to be divided. It is easier to argue with one another. It is easier to bicker along denominational lines. It is easier to bicker along, along political lines or ideology. It is easier to do that than to come together and find common ground and find places where we can talk and have conversations. I'm sure many of you are familiar with a little toy. Not much of a toy in and of itself, but the toy that I'm referring to, or the pieces that I'm referring to, is the, toy, the Legos. Legos, you know? Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. Because after your children play and you think you've got it cleaned up and you go to vacuum your living room or your playrooms and you hear all the clanking and clattering in your vacuum cleaner from all of the Legos that are being sucked up into the bag. Or even worse, when you suddenly have to get up at night to take care of a crying child and as you're walking, running barefooted to their room, you step on one of those Legos. Terrible pieces of plastic. Horrible, different colors. You look at them and by themselves, they're nothing. They're, they're, you know, piece of plastic with raised ridges and then you stack them on. Ah, oh, but you take enough Legos of all shapes and sizes and put them together, you can make some amazing things, right? Can I tell you something? Church is like Legos. We're made up of different people from different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different situations. But we are the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ. And we need to remember that. And so what we're going to do over the next several weeks is we're going to talk about together. Not divided, not separated, not any of that. Together. But how do you, how do you come together? How do you, how do, because there's so many opinions, there's so many differences, there's so many situations. How do we come together 
as a body. How do we do it here at church? And if you're looking for a church and you're looking for a place to be, you say, Pastor, I just haven't found the right church. Let me, let me lovingly, caringly remind you. And, and Redbud is probably tired of hearing me say this, but it's true. If you're here and you're visiting us, thank you for being here. I hope you give Redbud consideration. But can I tell you something? There's a lot of good churches in Lubbock. There's a lot of good churches in Lubbock. This is one of them. There's no reason why we shouldn't have a church family. You need to be a part of one. You need to find one. You need to ask God to lead you to that church. So we're going to talk about together. Today I'm going to talk to you just for a few minutes about peace. Together we find peace. Next week we'll look at together we experience love. And then the week after that we'll talk about together we grow stronger. And finally we'll talk about together we can change the world. Listen, if the first three do not happen, we can't change anything. Amen? If we cannot come to terms with peace, if we cannot come to terms with love, if we cannot come to terms with growing together stronger, we can't change the world. You can't, ex you can't expect to change the world or have any impact. Let me give you a statistic that I learned this week, and it just it floored me. And obviously the numbers are, are, are probably dated a little bit, but still the point is, 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 is interesting. There are 6.9, probably more than that by now, but six, go with the 6.9 figure. 6.9 billion people in the world. And ask yourself what it would take to win all of those people to Christ. I think the statistic was like 3,000, how many James, do you remember the number? You forgot the number. It was like 3,000 uh, people a day for X amount of years to win. And it was this astronomical number. Almost an impossibility. But it changes when, if everybody does their share and then, and then you, you double yourself, and then you, it's the whole, the whole mathematical equation of multiplication. The closest that I could come to was the, 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 the law of, of, of earning interest, and interest upon interest. And that is that if we all do our part, you see, you don't have to do a whole lot, just your, your part. We can make a difference. But if we don't find peace and if we don't find love and if we can't grow stronger together, we're not going to get it done. I want to take you to a passage of scripture. It's right there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17 and 22. And I want to give you three quick things and then we're, we're going to go. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 17 through 22. Would you stand with me? Let's read God's word. Paul wrote in this particular letter, he said, And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the house of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word and thank you for the blessing of it. I pray now that your Holy Spirit would come and equip us and teach us as, as this passage that we have read. Lord, may it speak to our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Over the next several weeks, we'll go over this letter of, the, of, 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 the, of Ephesians. But the letter of Ephesians is one of four that Paul wrote from prison. This is one of those letters that, that it has a different twist on it. Uh, the first three chapters, he spends teaching doctrine. He talks about grace and salvation and, and all of those important doctrines. And he, 
And there's this powerful prayer at the beginning of, his, of this letter. And then the last three chapters are all about application. How, how, do we, how do we do what he says in the first three chapters? How, how do we take the teachings of chapter 1, 2, and 3 and, and do something with them? How do we apply them? How do we live those things out? So the last three chapters, he talks about how to do that. And, and so one of, the, one of the most famous passages of Scripture that, that we have is found actually right there in chapter 2, the chapter that I just read. But there are verses 8 and 9, many of you know them by heart. They say this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so when it comes to... When it comes to salvation, when it comes to eternal life, when it comes to knowing God, Jesus, whatever term you want to use, Paul basically says this, nothing that you can do good will get you to heaven, period. Nothing good that you can do will get you to heaven. You can't earn your way there. You can't, you can't buy your way there. You can't spend a lot of money doing it. You can't, be, you, you can't go to heaven being the best Baptist that there ever was or any other kind of person, you, 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 you're not going to get there. The only way to get to heaven is if you ac acknowledge and realize that you and I are sinners, that we're lost, we're lost in our sin, and we can't help ourselves and we can't save ourselves, and that the only way to heaven is to trust the Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross for you. He was uh, the substitute. You should have been there. I should have been there, but he took your place and he took on the punishment that I deserved and because of what Jesus Christ did, Paul says in the letter of Ephesians, because of what he did and not what about you can do is the only reason and the only way that you can ever get to heaven. Whatever else anyone adds to that is wrong. It's false. I'm not telling you this. I'm telling you what Paul says in his letter. And so that's, that's Paul's whole gist when it comes to that particular teaching. The grace of God was free. Unmerited. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We can't buy it. We can't win it. You can't participate in the lottery and get it. You can, there's nothing. God gave it to us free. And if you believe that, if you believe in your heart, with all of your heart, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came to die on the cross for your sin, and that he resurrected on the third day and ascended into heaven, and he's coming back. If you believe what Jesus did for you, and you confess it with your mouth, Paul says, you shall be saved. You shall have eternal life, whatever term you want to use. And if you've done that, then how do you live that life out? What do you do? Well, in this passage that we just read, Paul talks about one of the ways to do that, and that's the subject of peace. The world right now is desperate for peace. Politicians are working for peace. World leaders are, are looking for peace. Maybe you're here this morning and you've got turmoil in your life. Maybe, maybe your life is a, 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 a mess right now. Maybe your life just got sent into a whirlwind and, and you don't have any calm. You don't have any peace. You don't have any stability. Maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe that's some of us in here this morning. And you're looking for peace. You're looking for tranquility and calm. I want to tell you in just a minute that the only way you're going to do that is is to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other place. So how do you, how do we, how do we become, how do, how do we find peace? What is it that you, and how, how, what did Jesus do to bring peace? Look at verse, right quick, look at verse 17 and 18. Listen to what it says. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off. And to those who were near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. He, he mentions two groups in that verse. He says those who were afar off and those who were near. And the implication is that there was a group of people who were closer to God than the other group of people. They were afar off. The first group he's referring to is the, the Jewish people. The people, the nation of Israel, the, the people that God established, Abraham, those people, they, they were closer in the sense that they, they, he chose them. And, and, and all of the Bible, when we read it, it's, it's about how God worked with them and God getting them to where he needed to get them. And they failed him miserably many times. He's, those people were close in that sense. They had the Ten Commandments. They had the law. They had all of that knowledge. But, but yet their heart was far away. And then there's the rest of us. Those who are not Jewish, those who are not God's chosen people, 
the Bible calls us, we, we are called, you may not like the word, but we're called Gentiles. Those of us who are not Jewish, those of us who are not there, Gentiles, we're, we're the other group. And he says, there was a time prior to the Lord Jesus Christ, the near ones and the far ones, neither of them had any peace until Jesus Christ came. When Jesus Christ came, he brought peace. He brought peace individually, personally, and he brought peace among the group of people. Listen, there, the world, the leaders of the world want peace, but they, they want to buy it, they want to earn it, they want to debate it, they want to discuss it, they want to they fight out, and they want to even maybe even go to war before one of them finally decides that it's time to peace. They want peace, everybody wants peace, but I'm telling you right now, Paul says, Jesus, when he came, brought peace. Peace is already available, but peace will never happen until you and I come to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace, how do you get peace? Peace comes in unity. Peace comes when we're united. First, let me talk to you about this, and I've already alluded to most of it. The only way you're going to find peace is if you first get your relationship with God right. No other peace will ever come with any other person or any other generation or group of people until your relationship with God comes first. If you can get your relationship with God straight and right, then you can deal with your fellow man. But if your relationship is not right with God, you say, Pastor, well, are you saying that, that if I have a problem with other people in other groups, you're saying that my relationship with God is not right? That's exactly what I'm telling you. You can't say, I love God with all my heart. You can't say, I serve God with all of my heart. You can't say, I, I believe in God with all of my heart, but I hate my neighbor, can't stand them, don't like them, never going to meet them. I, I just, and, I, and I definitely won't cross the street to go share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them because I can't stand them. Good luck with that when you get to the pearly gates. <laughs> See how far that's going to fly. No. You got to get your relationship with God straight first. Amen. And when you get your relationship, listen, when your relationship with, with God is straight first, skin color, ethnicity, denomination, political party, all of that falls by the wayside. Some of us don't believe it, but it will. If Jesus is center, if you let Jesus Christ be the center, that'll happen. And so the first point that I want to leave you today is that the way you find peace is when we come together and our relationship with God is first. But notice what Jesus, uh, Paul says here. That after Jesus came, these two groups were able to unite together. You see, the church in Ephesus was made up of all kinds of people. Ephesus is, is, is located in what we call today modern-day Turkey. Modern-day Turkey is an Islamic state. That's where the church of Ephesus was. And it was made up of a lot of people from diverse places and locations. And they were part of the church. And they loved each other. And they supported one another. And more importantly, the Gentiles, whom the Jews hated, became part of the body of Christ. And because of the Lord Jesus Christ, they came together. I want to tell you, No amount of discussion and debate is going to bring peace to this world until the Lord Jesus Christ is center of everything that happens on this planet, period. You can forget it. So we, what, so what's the lesson for us as a church then? We can pray for our politicians. We can pray for our world leaders because we're supposed to do that. But you and I, the body of Christ, have the answer. And that answer, and that voice, and that light needs to outshine everything else that the world is throwing at us. 
The question is, are we going to do it? So peace and unity. We're no longer foreigners and strangers, Paul says. We're now family. The second point I want to leave you with today as we move on to this, to, to this series is peace in God's presence. Peace is not, listen, peace is not a place. Peace is not a power. Peace is a person. And Jesus is that person. Peace is not a place. Peace is not a location. Peace is not a settled argument. Peace is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having built, been built up on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. If you want to bring peace into the world, if you want to bring peace into your household, if you want to bring peace into your family, if you want to bring peace into your workplace, if you want to do that, start with the Lord Jesus Christ and work out of that. Peace in unity, peace in God's presence. He is our peace. But now watch. The last thing I want to tell you <clears throat> is the way of peace. The way of peace. What is the way of peace? How do we get there? If, if, if Jesus is, is, the, is the roadmap, if he's the one to get us there, if he's the one, how do, how do we, what, what, what happens? This is where we're going to put church in context. There's a lot of people who say, ah, church is not important. doesn't matter. You don't have to be in church, this, that, and the other. What they mean is fellowship right here or inside this building. I don't know which one. But whatever they mean, I want to tell you something. Church is important, and I'm going to tell you why. This ought to solve every issue about why we should be together in fellowship as a church. Listen to, what, listen to what Paul wrote. He said, so this is what's happening. Jesus is the sinner. Jesus is the peace. He's the one that brought it. He's the one that reconciled us and brought us together. Now watch this. Verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, so they laid that foundation, and Jesus was the cornerstone because everything the apostles said, everything the, the disciples said, the apostles, everything that they taught from Old Testament to New Testament, everything they taught was pointing to Jesus Christ. And so Jesus was the chief cornerstone. They, they, they the apostles, the prophets, they, they, they worked out of or away from the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Now watch verse 21. In whom? Who? Christ. In whom? The whole building. What building? What building is he talking about? I can tell you what building he's not talking about. He's not talking about this brick and mortar. Or whatever church you come from or whatever brick building you have. He's not talking about that building. That, God could care less about those. There's another building. There's a body. It's called the body of believers, the church, the Christ, that's the one that's being built up. Je Listen, God doesn't come down here and try to build this thing up. Now, we should, but, but, but he doesn't. What he's building is what's inside this building. That's you and me. That's what he's building. Now, what's he doing with it? Well, watch this. In whom the whole building being joined together. Do you see that? Together. You know what Jesus is trying to do with us right here, Redbud Baptist Church, and anybody else who wants to be a part of this church or any other church? You know what Jesus is trying to do? He is trying to weave us together like those little Legos that you take and you put them on top of each other, and then you form this beautiful ship or this beautiful boat or this beautiful building. That's what Jesus is trying to do with your ethnicity, with his ethnicity, with you as a person, with you as your skin color, whatever you are, whatever you come from. That's what Jesus is doing. He's taking you and me, you may be tall and skinny and I may be short and fat, whatever. But Jesus is taking us all and he is connecting us and he's trying to build not your church, not my church, his church. That's what Jesus is trying to do. And the question that we have to answer is, are we on board? Are we on board? Listen, church is not about your comfort. Church is not about your comfort. Church is about his comfort. It is not about what you get out of church. It is about the glory of God. And he gets the honor. And he gets the respect. And listen, if you leave church and you didn't leave comfortable, that's okay. The question is not, did you leave comfortable? The question is, was God satisfied? When you and I sing and we worship God through song, 
The question is not, was the audience entertained? The question is, was God entertained? Did he uh, receive approval? Was he acknowledged? Was he worshiped? It's not about us. It's not about you. It's about God and the church that he is building. And he's doing it through me and through you. Join together. Now watch this. Grows into a holy temple in the Lord. You know what God is looking at when he's building us as a body? He's looking at it as a and he uses a term that you and I are understand. He's, he looks at us as a temple. Well, what do you do in a temple? We call them church or church building, but what do you do in a temple? You worship. We come here to worship. If you're from another church, you go there to worship. It's about him. You go there to worship. That's what you do in a temple. Watch this. In whom you also are being built Together, watch this, for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Can I tell you something? This body right here and any other body, you know what God is doing? He is Lego by Lego, piece by piece, building a place that He can inhabit. God wants, listen, God wants to come to church. This church, he wants to bless this church. He wants to be in it. He wants to rejoice in his body. He wants to bless it. But if you make it about you and me, I want to tell you right now, God's not going to share that with you. God's not going to share that with you. He is holy. And righteous. He's not some puppet on a string that you can pull this cord or that cord and he responds, responds to your every move whenever you feel like it. He's God. Oh, if you would just get that, if we would all just get that. He wants to inhabit his church. He wants to be a part of the church. He wants you to experience what it means like. Have you ever been in a worship service that when you walked out of that place, whatever else happened, you had to agree to say, God came down today. You ever been part of that? You ever been part of that? God came down today. I mean, God spoke. God did. God said something. God changed something. Why? Because the group collected there of, of believers were all of one mind that God is the sinner and Christ is the sinner. And when that happens, God comes down. The same holds true for you in your life. When you decide to take your little piece, your little Lego, and turn it over to him and let him take you and place you in the body of believers where he knows you fit. When you get to that point, when you get to that point in the body of believers, I'm telling you, God will come down. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't have a church. I invite you to consider Redbud. We're definitely not perfect, that's for sure. But we are a body and we want to do the will of God and we want to follow him and we want him to be the sinner. So if you're looking for a church and you want to know more about Redbud, we'd like to tell you about Redbud. In just a few moments, if you want to just come down here and pray with me and James, we'd like to talk to you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never, never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've been trusting in your good works. You've been trusting in your way of doing things. You've been believing that by you doing it the way you're doing it, you're going to get into heaven. I'm going to tell you, and I'm sitting here telling you today, you can't unless you trust Christ first. And so as our, as our instrumentalists come, I'm going to invite them to come. And we're going to pray. We're going to stand and we're going to sing. And James and I will be up here in the front. And if God spoke to you this morning, if you, if you are looking for peace this morning, listen, I'm here to tell you Jesus will give it to you. Jesus will give it to you if you trust him. 
Would you bow your head and would you pray with me? Father, I come to you now. Lord, I, I pray that, that if there's anyone here this morning and they don't have peace inside their heart, it's not calm there. There's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of waking up in the mornings or late at night just wondering, thinking. There's, there's trouble in the heart. And Father, they, they, they desperately want to be at peace. God, would you draw them here to this altar? Lord, if there's somebody there that can walk with them, help them do that. Father, if there's someone here who never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, never really given their life to Christ, Father, would you touch their heart? And Lord, if there's somebody here who's looking for a church, a place to belong, a body of believers to be a part of, and to be placed where you want them to be placed, Father, I pray that you draw them. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing, would you stand? And if God spoke to your heart, we'll pray with you. We'll talk to you up here. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to do anything that would embarrass you. But if you need prayer, we'll be glad to do that. James or I or anybody else. Would you come? Right?